Thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and welcome everybody. And to those of you who were involved in a meeting earlier today, my apologies because I'm going to repeat much of what I said this morning. Um, I'd, I want to introduce uh, a study that, uh, that a team working with me has undertaken in the World Bank looking at um, the kind of issues that the World Bank will be challenges that the World Bank and the World Bank's clientele, the countries and, and parties that we work with, will be facing in the year 2025. Um, the reason that, that I picked uh, the year 2025 is because we tend to be rather short-term in our outlook uh, in the development world these days, and, and I wanted to think a little bit further out than, than the normal uh, uh, development agenda, which tends to follow what countries have, which are sort of five-year plans. Um, the, the key questions that we have are really around the balance between country-owned, country-driven development, which is recognized as best practice, particularly for poverty reduction, and the issues that regional and global public goods and the challenges around uh, the, the maintenance and, and util utilization of those global public goods or avoidance of global public bads <coughs> present for the sustainability of, of developing countries to alleviate poverty and, and grow economically. How do you achieve a balance between the two? Uh, and the, so the first question is, is there a balance? And I think the, the, the answer, the conclusion that we've drawn is no, there's not. Uh, we have become in the in the development community, in in my opinion, very much focused on country-owned, country-driven agenda, uh, and again, correctly so for alleviating poverty. But we haven't done a very good job of of looking at the the longer-term regional and global issues. But we all recognize that those regional and global issues are extremely important for sustainable development. So the next question is, and this relates to the discussion we've been having today, is whether or not development finance as it exists today is, is suitably uh, designed to meet the needs of addressing regional and global issues on, on a long-term basis. Um, in looking at the World Bank itself, and, and largely, I think, uh, multilateral development banks, the uh, uh, one question, if you're looking at 2025, one question you immediately ask is what our clientele will look like in, in 10, 15 years. Um, there's a study done by the Center for Global Development that tells us that IDA, the soft arm of the World Bank, uh, that about half of the countries that are eligible for IDA today will have graduated, uh, meaning they will have moved up the economic ladder and uh, will not be eligible in 2025. And that, that, uh, that graduation means that because some of those are very large, uh, uh, heavily populated countries, that we'll actually have about one-third the population. So half the number of countries, one-third the population to be serviced by IDA in 2025 if you use today's definitions and if these economic projections are accurate. Uh, the second question is, is on the IBRD side, the, the uh, less con concessional side of the World Bank. Uh, uh, the, the primary recipients of, of funding from IBRD are middle income countries. Uh, the largest borrowers today are China, Mexico, Brazil, uh, and a few others. And it's kind of hard to imagine that 10 years from now, given the, the uh, growth trajectories of those countries, that they're going to be major borrowers from the World Bank in 10, 15 years. So where does that leave the World Bank in terms of clientele? That's, that's a, one of the first questions that need to ask. Second is, what is the future of development finance, uh, in particular ODA? Um, and the, the, the OECD numbers that have recently come out are showing a reduction in, in ODA. Uh, the reality is that climate finance is becoming a, uh, a very new major player in terms of, of development finance. Um, and the arguments that, that that money will be new and additional, I think, are uh, uh, probably interesting political arguments, but not very well attached to reality. Uh, 
And, and the way to check this, if you, if you question that, is <coughs> to watch over the coming several months where we're going to have negotiations for IDA replenishment, the Global Environment Fund replenishment, and the establishment of the, of the Green Climate Fund. And it'll be very interesting to watch those three, um, those three negotiations running in parallel that, that access uh, pretty much the same group of countries for, for sourcing those, those uh, funds. And, and I think that the results of that negotiation would be very telling. Um, but in any case, ODA, even if it stayed where it is today, it's a, sh it's, it's a smaller part of development finance. The, the uh, foreign direct investments and uh, domestic budgets are, are increasingly make ODA look smaller and smaller. So what do we, over time, what do we do to make sure that, that as a global community we optimize the, the impact of those kind of sources? Um, another issue that, that I think is really important if you're looking at 2025 from a development point of view is to, is to pay attention to urban growth. Uh, in just looking at Asia, uh, which is an area where I've done most of my work, it'll go from about 1.9 billion urbanites to 3.3 billion in 2050. Um, just as an example, India will add 497 million urbanites, China 341 million, Indonesia 92 million. These are huge, huge increases in, in the urban sector, in, in uh, cities. Um, concurrent with that, the McKinsey study that came out not long ago tells us that that with this economic growth, we're going to see about 600 million new consumers over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And these are primarily, these are people who will have enough discretionary income that they will be going way beyond just meeting their, their basic needs and they'll have an opportunity to buy things like cars and refrigerators and air conditioners and steaks and wine and, you know, all the things that we all like. And who can blame them? Uh, but the consumption Im implications of 600 million new uh, consumers are, are actually very stunning. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, very interesting statistics that McKinsey came up with is the, an estimate that China will require uh, new floor space, new construction of floor space, equivalent to 85% of today's building stock. That's huge. That's an area about the size of Australia. By when? Uh, this is by 2025. Uh, and uh, so that's another issue, the consumption, the, the demand for materials and goods. Uh, and I'll talk about climate change quite a bit in a minute, but just note that the concrete and steel that's going to be the source of that uh, new floor space is co the uh, cement and steel industry together uh, make up about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So there are obvious linkages, not just a consumption of, of steak and, and so on, but there's the, the whole building construction uh, industry, the consumption side of that's very important. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're seeing a number of risks increasingly affecting the development agenda, financial crisis, food crisis, uh, the, uh, the, the issues of, of epidemics, uh, and then the climate crisis and, and other crises. But let me, let me focus on the climate crisis first. And, and mainly that's what I'm gonna talk about from, from here on. Because basically my argument, our, our study is arguing that unless you focus on climate change and other global uh, issues, global public good issues, then you cannot achieve long-term sustainable development. Uh, we've been focused on a two degree world uh, for some time on what are the impacts of a two degree world by the end of this century. Now, that was a political decision that came out of Copenhagen, but it's also wishful thinking. Uh, Saturday was a, was a major day uh, in the climate world. We broke the 400 parts per million concentration of ambient uh, GHG or carbon equivalent concentration. Um, that's, that's a big deal. That, that indicates that we could be hitting a what we thought was going to be a two degree world at the end of this century. Uh, we could hit it by about 2037 was the uh, latest calculation. And a recent study published by the World Bank that was work mainly undertaken by the Potsdam Climate Institute uh, tells us that 
current commitments to greenhouse gas reductions will take us to a three to three and a half degree world by the end of this century. And based on current emissions, the trajectory is the actual, actually what's happening, we'll have a four degree world by as early as 2060. And nobody really knows what a four degree world means, but I guarantee it's scary. With that, could you run that little clip? So, so the question is, and I'm, again, I'm using climate change as an example of a global public good issue. Uh, there are other global public good issues for sure, but climate change is what I consider the woolly mammoth in the room. It, it affects everything. And, and so any discussion that uh, ignores these impacts is kind of uh, uh, ignoring one of the, you know, the most critical issues. So. Looking at climate change, the question is, in the development world, what can we do about this? What is What kinds of changes need to take place over the coming years in an institution like the World Bank and and with ODA in general to actually address this challenge? And I, what we are concluding and, and uh, what isn't all that difficult to conclude is, first off, it's not an either-or issue. Uh, obviously, if you're going to turn down the heat, you've got to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the main places you do that are in developed countries and middle income countries. But you don't do that at the expense of development in the poorest countries because those countries are already getting hit by climate impacts, number one, and the only way that they will be less, uh, that they will actually survive these climate impacts is by increasing resilience and you increase resilience by economic development. So we need to focus on poverty reduction, economic development in those countries. So it's, it's not an either or, first off. But on the, on the first one, on, on the, the mitigation side, we're looking at how we could become a little more innovative to actually initiate action at scale, at, at a scale large enough to actually see a bend in the GHG curve in, in time to actually reduce the risks that we run into a three and a half to four degree world. Um, and uh, probably the best bet 
is at is at the city level because of the the future growth of cities that that dramatic increase in in urbanization that's coming up presents an opportunity to actually focus on on resilience in those cities on on being resilient to the impacts of climate change increased floods and so on but also developing cities that are low carbon so that we actually uh, reduce in many cities that are already built up uh, emissions by shifting energy use by dramatically focusing on uh, or focusing on dramatic reductions in in uh, GHG emissions from uh, by improving energy efficiency and and what studies are showing is that you can actually do that at scale you can do it fast enough and it's affordable uh, so if it's affordable why isn't it already happening and this is where the question of how you use development finance comes in. It's not happening because there are too many risks still to be able to mobilize the private sector flows. Uh, primarily, these will have to come from institutional investors, pension funds, sovereign funds, and others. But we're talking about trillions of dollars. We're at a minimum of 1.3 trillion per year probably to, to, uh, to really get the kind of movement required in the in the urban sector for low carbon climate resilient development, um, the risks are are just not satisfactory at this stage of the game for institutional investors to come to the table. Almost no matter how good of an idea you pr present in front of them, um, the they just their risk appetite is is quite limited, partly because of the financial crisis. So what can public sector money do to improve their willingness to engage in uh, large-scale investments in low-carbon climate-resilient cities. And that's, it, it's, I, I wish I had the answer to that, we don't yet, but that's where the, the discussion is going now. Is, and that's what we need to be thinking about in our view. If, if you look at uh, <coughs> development assistance, development finance uh, in the coming years is really <coughs> new ways of using that beyond doing projects and, and uh, to a certain extent, budget support, but how can you really move beyond the country level and address regional and global issues in a, uh, by using those funds in a different way? And then finally, the, the other conclusion, that if you look at 2025 and you look at institutions like the World Bank and the changes required, there's, there's going to have to be a shift in the way we partner, the way we collaborate. No single institution, no single country can tackle these problems that we're talking about. And we all know that, and we've been working together for some time. But we tend to not think long-term in partnerships, and we, think, we t tend to not think adequately about impact of partnerships and accountability of partnerships. So, so we think that we're actually going to be looking at a very new kind of partnering or collaboration in the future on how to tackle these big issues, making long-term commitments, not through, not necessarily through international agreements like the UN negotiations. Those need to go on, uh, but, at the, but in parallel and in support of, our view is that we need new kinds of partnerships of like-minded parties, not countries, but parties, um, states, non-state, that come together and tackle these issues uh, with, at scale. There's, the potentials are all there. There's a huge amount of work required on how you package these, these kinds of investment programs. Uh, but, but there is momentum, and I think the discussions that we had today showed that there's a, a high level of willingness of a number of, uh, of folks who have been in the development finance game for some time to think in these terms. And certainly this is where the World Bank is thinking. Thank you. Thanks very much, Warren. Um, I think the discussions that we had today with um, the group that was here from various donors focused on um, sort of a number of different areas where the context is changing. Probably the most significant is the one you're talking about, which is around ENDS and particularly around global public goods. But we also had discussions around shifting actors, changing geographies of poverty and growth, which was um, touched on in your introduction. And also the notion of you know, a more complex group of actors involved in development from emerging powers, from private sectors, and from other communities. So the next contribution will be from Peter Laws, looking at how all of this looks from the perspective of a 
quotes traditional bilateral mm. development agents. 